Hey there. Good afternoon. Straight up four o'clock in the mountain time, which means six o'clock on the East Coast and three on the West Coast. There is one place that you need to be today, and it is my favorite place to be every Tuesday afternoon at this time. This is Fertility with Fink and Friends. I am Fink. You are friends, and it is so nice to be here live from Colorado Springs, where it is a beautiful sunny 57 degrees outside today. And uh, boy, what a happy Tuesday afternoon. Uh, gosh, uh, it looks like a bunch of people are joining in here. So let me see if I can't uh, say hi to uh, everybody I can see real quick. So I've got some different feeds here. Right here in the middle is... Uh, is uh, YouTube and uh, and Facebook. We've got a couple of different Instagram feeds here. Oh, there's also LinkedIn there in the middle. A couple of different. Uh, we've got uh, CNY's Instagram. We've got my Instagram, Randy Fink MD. Uh, and let's see what we say. Reiki Marcus, Boss Queen. How are you? Nice to see you. Uh, uh, baby, uh, baby stings. Uh, Liz K. Uh, Liz Nader, I think that says. Um, oh, Faith, congratulations. You've got seven blasts frozen. That is wonderful. And hi to Liz. Uh, who is our first? Erica Walden. Erica, thanks for being here. You were number one to join the CNY uh, Instagram side. Hey to Shabnam. Uh, Eliminate Seltzer. I like it. Reiki Marcus, good to see you here on this Tuesday. Um, let's see. Uh, David, uh, I see uh, AZ Sunshine. Um, uh, looks like if BB Pro Muscle Barbie is excited for a follow-up. Well, I'm excited too with a name like that. Holy cow. Uh, that's awesome. And let's see what we have. Skittles8799. Good to see you as always. Thank you for being here. Uh, first up on my Instagram, Rachel Rapp. Rachel, oh no, sorry, Rachel Arap. Yes, indeed, a special wave to you. Thanks for being my number one on Instagram here today. We've got Nadia uh, Sharmila. Hello, my friend. Um, S Strand 84. We've got Barbara Brown. Oh, hello, Jody. Jody is here with us. Uh, hello, Lou Leah Schmink. Howdy. Um, Coco Fitness, nice to see you. You get a special wave there too. Uh, hi to Melissa and to Nadia. And uh, let's see, uh, Linda Wynn, Linda Wynn Trang, I should say. Bunch of other names there. And who do we have saying hi? Samantha and Julie over here on the Facebook side. So I'm going to get to all your questions as best we can, as always. But a couple things I want to start out with. Um, the first is, hey, did you get to see the uh, did you get to see the uh, the eclipse? Um, uh, because I think there is a lesson in there, as always. But um, so so I went outside. So we're here in Colorado, and we weren't going to be seeing. You know, we we weren't uh, certainly we're pretty far west of the path of totality. So, so we didn't get uh, darkness in the sky or anything like that. But I said, well, you know what, I want to see what, uh, you know, what this is all about. This is kind of a kind of a special thing. I can remember going outside looking at the eclipse um, as kids. In fact, I spoke with my brother, who said, hey, do you remember when we were little in Atlanta, we went out and, you know, and, uh, and, and looked up at the sky. And I'm like, you know what I do? I do. I remember it as it gives a very, you know, kind of a formative experience. Um, you know, and something that you sort of always remember. So uh, um, I, I think it's, you know, it's special. Uh, but so uh, we went outside uh, for a couple of minutes um, and looking at the sky and looking at the sky. And the, I, okay, I, I will admit that the light was a little bit different. Um, the light had, uh, you know, kind of took on a strange hue. Um, and okay. I don't know if you can hear that noise, but it sounds like a helicopter is either landing in my uh, parking lot aside from me here, or there's a lawnmower that's trying to get in the front door. So anyway, so I went outside, take a look, and, and I'm looking at the sky, and I'm looking at the sky, and I'm looking at the sky, and I don't see, you know, I see the sun. Um, and yeah, you're not supposed to look at the sun. So I, I wasn't looking directly at it. I kept holding my phone and taking pictures, you know, up that way. Uh, trying to get the sun, looking at the pictures, and you see the whole round sun there. It wasn't doing anything at all. And I'm like, this is a scam. I think we're being scammed here because, uh, you know, clearly this has something to do, it must have something to do with China. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's uh, uh, you know, I, whatever it is, you know, this is a scam. This thing is not really happening because I'm looking and I don't see a damn thing. And so it was really pretty disappointing. And then a very lovely lady, 
from the adjacent building came over and said, um, um, here, try my glasses. So we took the glasses and looked and, oh my God, you could see, you know, almost the entirety of the sun being blocked out. But when you looked at it with the naked eye, um, it looked like regular old sunny day. The sun looked completely the same. So I guess the lesson to be had there was that, um, well, everything that, you know, what you see is not what you get. It's not necessarily what meets the eye. There's always something, um, always something when you scratch the surface. And when you look at it with a new pair of eyes, sometimes it really takes on a completely different appearance. Um, and I think that definitely holds true in this fertility world because um, um, I can, uh, you know, there are many times that I've looked at a protocol and I've talked to someone again and again and again. Um, and, um, and then they talk to somebody different and get a completely different, different look at the situation and they say, oh, you know what? I understand what Fink was saying, but maybe we want to try this. Um, and we'll be Or what's going on? Oh, there we go. I think we're back again. Looks like we lost Facebook video for a minute. Um, so, um, yeah, maybe there is more to, to meets the eye than that. Okay, so the second thing that I wanted to talk about here has to do with kind of so, oh, actually, and if you saw my Instagram from yesterday, I, I took a picture of the sun and I took the black marker and I colored it in. I said, gosh, nature is so wonderful. But then today's uh, little post, if you saw it, um, was that uh, we're getting all kinds of strange, crazy things happen in here with the internet. But um, so then when uh, when you looked at my Instagram uh, uh, from today, if you saw it, um, it was this cool little thing with the eclipse and oh, wow, cool things happen here. The, the, the sun goes, or the sun, you know, passes by or the moon passes by the sun and it shows this image of CNY. If you haven't seen it, it's on CNY and my uh, Instagram thing. Cool things happen here and, and cool things definitely do happen here. So um, the second thing goes to um, sort of a, a groundbreaking um, article uh, that has uh, that was published fairly recently that looked at people with recurrent implantation failure or recurrent pregnancy loss. And what it found is that one of the medications that we often use in our uh, immune protocol, and that medication is called Prograf or Tacrolimus. And I think I mentioned this last week, but uh, I've already seen some very significant results from it. So I do want to share it. I want to get the word out. CNY is changing some of its protocol uh, around this. Everybody at CNY doesn't necessarily know about it yet. And I don't know that uh, all of our global team, for instance, or that some of our uh, providers will have even read the article. But basically, if you fall into that category, recurrent implantation failure, recurrent pregnancy loss, uh, people have had a bunch of transfers where they should have gotten pregnant and they haven't. Um, what we know now is that using tacrolimus or Prograf in a dose of 1.5 milligrams twice daily or for a total of three milligrams per day um, has a very dramatic effect on helping folks to have their embryos implant and to maintain a pregnancy. So in every situation where I see it, where it runs across, where your case runs across my desk, or we meet at the time of a transfer or a retrieval, or or we have a phone call where I'm able to look at that and see it, I am suggesting uh, that you do just that. Many clinics uh, would use previously in the past 0.5 milligrams twice a day. And as part of our immune protocol level three, we would switch off between some Plaquenil and some Prograf, and the Prograf was always at that 0.5 dose. Well, we start Prograf now at um, um, a couple of days, like around the time of the progesterone start or a couple of days, few days before the embryo transfer. And, uh, and uh, you can stay on it through about 12 weeks uh, through the first trimester. And there really is a very significant difference in, uh, in the pregnancy outcomes. How does that work? Well, I'll tell you real quick here without boring you too much, but there are, you know, imagine this is what's happening. When a pregnancy implants in the uterus, right? We've got the uterine wall here and the pregnancy comes along and it goes splat and it 
sort of takes up residence there in the wall of the uterus. That's what we know of as implantation. Well, at the level of the, of the lining, um, when the pregnancy takes hold, it's like any other foreign body that's invading your skin. Your body senses that as a, uh, potentially as an invader. There are two types of immune response in particular that go along with this, and that comes from what are known as T helper cells. The T helper cells react there. There's a type 1 T helper cell and the type 2. The type 1 cell sounds the alarm. All the alarm bells goes off and uh, go, go off and say, you know, hey, we got a problem here. Meanwhile, it's the type 2 cells that say, whoa, 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 cool it, cool it, take it easy. We don't have to react so aggressively. Well, it's thought that in folks who have an immune issue that's keeping those pregnancies from implanting, or keeping those pregnancies from growing. And that includes also things like recurrent biochemical pregnancies. The issue is, is that you've got too many type 1 cells, too much alarm bells, and not enough cool it. And so what does ProGraph do? It increases the cool it. It increases the type 2 uh, T helper cells. And so the ratio changes like it should be in normal situations that there is a a higher number of type two cells to uh, to type one cells, um, and so that is uh, that's how it works. This is a drug that's used in folks um, who have had uh, 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 organ transplants, things like kidney transplants, and where they first realized this was happening was in the situation where where uh, women with kidney transplants who you know, there are reproductive age women who, who have kidney transplants. They're not always the healthiest people. So you might expect that they don't have the best pregnancy outcomes, but they found that there was a group of these people who were having incredibly good pregnancy outcomes. Whoa, how could that even be possible? Didn't make any sense. And when they looked at it, it's because they were on the prograph. So then they said, well, okay, if this is the case with, with solid organ transplant, what about with embryo transfer? And that's where it was uh, found and ultimately studied and proven to be the case that, that uh, you can make a very significant difference in embryo transfer uh, success by, by altering that ratio of T helper type 1 to T helper 2 cells. The drug comes in a dose of 1 milligram and a 0.5 milligram and in a five milligram. So really the, the studies looked at 1.5 milligrams twice a day. Now what that in effect means is that you have to get two prescriptions. You have to get the one milligram capsule and you have to get the 0.5 milligram capsule and you have to take them both. Um, um, so that you're taking those two to equal 1.5 milligrams. You take it in the morning, you take it at night. There's a way that you can kind of extrapolate that. And that is, well, all right, it's three milligrams a day. Is there harm to saying, well, just take the one milligram tablet three times a day and you kind of get the same result. So I've been doing a little bit of both and I have seen already a couple of people here having uh, 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 already with positive pregnancy tests who, who have histories that would suggest that every time they do a transfer, they don't get pregnant. So um, I think it's very big news. I hope uh, I want you all to be aware of it. And, um, and hopefully that's going to make some meaningful difference in people's lives. Okay, now let's see if we can't get some questions. It's a quarter after the hour. We got another 45 minutes to see what you're talking about here today. So let's start, uh, if we can, with uh, my Instagram. Nadia says, oh, look at there. <laughs> can you talk about tacrolimus, what it's for? and what the recommended dose is. Well, you just got the mini lecture there, Nadia. Um, uh, so hopefully that answers the question. 1.5 milligrams twice a day. Um, Hello, Lou says we start our, do we start our immune protocol the same day as we start stims? So there are some aspects of our immune protocols that, um, that uh, that are really intended for stimulation, and there are others that have a, a greater effect on embryo transfer. So it depends on what it is, but generally speaking, you don't need to start the um, 
immune protocol medications until you until your cycle begins. Some people say, well, should I start my immune protocol the month before? The answer to that is no, no, I don't think there's any evidence to say that you uh, should do that. And in fact, the evidence says that even in the general population, all the immune drugs uh, may not be needed. But we do know that the immune system does play a role in preventing people from getting pregnant. So at CNY, we do focus on an immune protocol for just about every patient. Um, let's see, uh, Linda asked a history of two failed implantations, just uh, tested positive for chronic endometritis. Should I take the doxycycline now in hopes of conceiving naturally before doing IVF again? Well, so chronic endometritis is a chronic inflammation in the uterine lining. We typically treat that with doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice daily, for 14 days. And that tends to turn down the inflammation. Now, it's a it's a chronic inflammation, endometritis. It's not an acute thing. So it's not an infection with something per se, but it's something that, well, let's just say something that taunted that lining and created an immune response. We diagnose that by looking at what are called plasma cells. Plasma cells are the marker of the chronic endometritis. So is chronic endometritis something that prevents people from getting pregnant? Well, in nature, it, it's hard to say because uh, I've never seen a study that looked at, you know, the incidence of chronic endometritis in the general population. Certainly, we know in folks who are doing embryo transfers, the potential for chronic endometritis can definitely affect those transfer outcomes. So, Linda, I do think uh, it would make a difference in, in that regard. Um, but is that something that is known to prevent sperm from being able to meet egg? No, I don't think so. Um, I think it's more about an implantation type phenomenon. So I, I think you really have to ask yourself whether, you know, um, it's always fine to take a break from IVF and, and to try to conceive naturally because sometimes just, you know, going through the process is enough to change the plumbing to the point where people can get pregnant. So, um, but I wouldn't spend too much time on that. If you've been diagnosed with these types of fertility challenges, you know, the Well, the internet is like popping on and off here. So um, sorry about that. Um, so hopefully, Linda, that answers your question. Let's take a look at the Facebook side. Hi to everybody on Facebook. Look like 31 beautiful souls watching us on Facebook this afternoon. Thanks for being here. Samantha says, I messaged the nurses about which bundle to get. And they said it was recommended I get the mini bundle before even getting the blood work back. Can I choose to do standard even if that's not what's suggested? I'm doing gender selection. So I was under the impression standard would be the best anyway. So um, Samantha, to, to answer that question, we dose the medications that you'll use for stimulation based upon age, and secondarily, based upon your AMH, which is the uh, qualitative measure of your ovarian reserve. I don't know how old you are, but um, for me, I would say, you know, if or if I knew that you had a history of, for instance, polycystic ovarian syndrome, I'm always going to go with a lower dose or certainly for people who have who are in their 20s. Um, that's going to be a mini dose. If you're not in your 20s, a mini dose is always an option. Uh, but many of our providers will put a dose in that's considered a preliminary dose dependent upon the um, depending upon your blood levels. So you can certainly ask that that be reviewed once that your blood levels come back. What I would encourage you not to do is to start trying to uh, manage your dosing yourself because this is what we do all day long. And, um, and uh, so we do have experience with it, but um, so um, there may have been a bunch of reasons why, why that happened. You absolutely have a right to ask a provider uh, to look at your dosing based on the results of your blood tests. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Julie is here. Hi, Julie Hansen, 46 years old. We'll have my first egg retrieval next month. We'd like more information on a couple of particular meds for egg quality. Metformin, um, do you suggest this in general for egg quality or DOR? Um, 
and Omnitrope. Um, so um, to answer those two questions, at 46, irrespective of what your AMH is telling us about your um, about your uh, ovarian reserve, you will have issues with egg quality. And that is just simply based on your birth date. Um, the eggs that are in your ovary, and always tell people the sperm that come out today were manufactured in the, in the testicle three months ago. The eggs in the ovary, you were born with all of them you'll ever have. We can't change that. We can't put more eggs there. All the eggs that you'll ever have were there from the time of your birth. So in your case, Julie, all those eggs have been there for 46 plus years. And over that time, um, the DNA in those eggs becomes less stable. And so that's what I mean by egg quality, that egg quality becomes a challenge such that it is very, very difficult to get pregnant at 46, whether through IVF or certainly even naturally. Can it happen? Sure, it can happen. But I would say that um, egg quality is probably the most important thing uh, in your protocol. So to that end, yes, metformin is a medication that we use uh, for folks with diabetes. Uh, we use it in folks with polycystic ovarian syndrome, helps them to ovulate. But specifically in IVF, uh, it helps with egg quality. Um, and that is particularly true for people with an AMH of greater than three or an AMH of less than one. So in both those scenarios, I would consider metformin to be a good medication. Um, even without any history of diabetes, blood sugar, uh, obesity, uh, overweight, um, or insulin resistance, I, nevertheless, um, um, uh, metformin is a good thing in that regard. Um, Omnitrope is human growth hormone. In the anti-aging world, we would do a test called the IGF-1 that looks at, um, it's called an insulin-like growth factor, and that can make a big difference um, in whether you're using um, uh, growth hormone for, for anti-aging purposes and whether it's going to really make any difference for you. But as far as egg quality goes, we do not check an IGF-1, and there is no correlation between what that number is and the effect that that growth hormone may have on your egg quality. So specifically, growth hormone is what keeps us young. And at the level of the ovary, it may have the ability to help us to um, repair some of the age-damaged DNA. So in anyone who has a known history or based on age is likely to have an issue with egg quality or people who have been poor responders before, I feel very comfortable and will frequently recommend um, that you use Omnitrope. Now, the studies show us that Omnitrope, you know, it's controversial. Maybe a growth hormone doesn't really help anything except for it adds cost. There are some studies that show it doesn't make a difference. Um, empirically, I would tell you in my experience, it does. So um, I, I do use it and I probably would use it for you, Julie. Lindsay is here as well. I come in for my retrieval on Friday. Um, most of my follicles are between 11 and 19, but I have one that was 23. Tomorrow I go in for what they believe will be my last monitoring appointment. Will the 23 be too big? What is the biggest a follicle can be at a trigger and still believed to be a viable egg? Well, you know, that too is, is hard to say. It depends on some of that depends on age. Um, it depends on how quickly that follicle developed over what period of time, how long your stimulation has been. Uh, so if you're planning to retrieve on Friday and your egg is, uh, and you rather your follicle is a 23 today on Tuesday, my guess is by Friday that 23 may be a little bigger or that egg may degenerate before it comes out um, just because um, uh, that one may end up being a little over mature. So there's not a specific number Number, but just my gestalt Lindsay is that uh, I think that that one probably be might end up being a little too big. Let's see, Ash Fillingham is here on the CNY Instagram side. Typically, how long between a baseline appointment and a retrieval? I had my baselines today. So usually you do that baseline appointment for IVF on about cycle day three-ish. Um, usually uh, pretty shortly thereafter, you will start your stimulation. And in fact, really, um, I like, I like to start stims, you know, by day three, day four, 
at CNY, sometimes we start them by, by day five, and that's okay in most people, but in some people that can be a little late. So <clears throat> um, I'd keep an eye on that. Um, stimulation lasts for nine to 12 days, nine to 12 days. After that stim, you will get a trigger shot. And the trigger shot uh, tells the ovaries we're ready to come for those eggs. 35 hours later, you'll have your egg retrieval. So you're looking at within, uh, if you're day three, you know, probably by day 12, 13, 14, uh, you'll be thinking about having uh, an egg retrieval. Hi to Just Lindsay. Uh, Erica asks, hi, Erica Walden. Um, uh, slightly low AMH uh, endo uh, endometriosis with poor ovarian response. When do you recommend um, ovarian PRP? So PRP is a good thing in general, but what I have to tell you about PRP is that it's, you know, it's experimental. So we, you know, we don't know all the precise answers as to who is the best candidate for PRP. Um, what is the optimal timing before a stem? What is the optimal number of treatments to have of, of ovarian PRP? So some of that is just guesswork. And I would say lower, you know, poor ovarian response or lower egg quality uh, is potentially an indication for doing intraovarian PRP. What I recommend, in, and again, this is just my opinion, um, that uh, you do it uh, about a month before you intend to do your, um, uh, your stimulation. So at the beginning of a cycle, because we know that one cycle later, we're going to be starting uh, your IVF stimulation. Um, then, especially if we know that you're not a great responder or that you have a lower AMH, we're going to be in the situation where we would likely want to do more than one cycle, more than one retrieval. So if you believe that that's going to be the best choice for you, then I would say, let's, um, let's do another round of PRP at the time of your retrieval. And then a month later, you do another retrieval, which is going to be a stacked cycle or a back-to-back -back cycle. So that gives us great benefit right there, doing a cycle back-to-back. And when you add the PRP to it, I've really seen some very good results. So uh, yes, AZ Sunshine, can we ask questions? Well, the answer is yes, my friend. Um, let's see here. Uh, what are the, symptom, uh, the symptoms of frozen embryo after day seven? I got cramping. Uh, I don't know necessarily that there are any particular symptoms that are associated with uh, either positive or negative outcomes. Uh, but some people do have a little bleeding. You can have an implantation bleed. You can have a little cramping. Um, so I think really, you know, anything is possible. People say, well, I started to get nauseated right away. And I would say, well, nausea uh, probably really begins close to about six weeks when associated with pregnancy. Um, so could you have nausea before then? Yeah, absolutely you could. Um, but if you're a little nauseated here or there, that may be more likely Um something else. Um, you know what the, what is anybody know? Listen, I'm asking a question like you're going to raise your hand. What's the first um, symptom that people usually have associated with pregnancy? I don't hear you answering class. Um, it's the, uh, it's usually breast tenderness. Usually it's in the breast. Um, and that's because many of the changes that are associated um, um, hormonally um, start to affect the breast first. Estrogen causes a proliferation of the glandular portions of the breast, while progesterone causes a proliferation of what we call the stroma of the breast, and that's the fatty tissue and all the rest of the breast that's not the actual glands. And so some people are more sensitive to one of those hormones uh, than the other, but breast tenderness, uh, um, um, nipple sensitivity, um, increasing size is often um, the first sign. Uh, let's see what we got here. I know we got some more questions. There we go. AZ Sunshine, you got your question in. Outstanding. My friend has endometriosis and I have a low egg reserve and can she, um, donate her eggs? So, um, you can definitely have a, um, 
you can definitely have a, uh, a known donor. Folks with endometriosis will often, uh, or in many cases, have a lower ovarian reserve because endometriosis can affect, endometriosis kind of affects two things um, in addition, well, it affects more than that, but uh, certainly it affects the anatomy. It can cause scar tissue and change the anatomy and cause a pain syndrome. But specifically with regard to um, uh, fertility, one, um, it, um, it causes, it can decrease the ovarian reserve. And secondly, it can cause a problem with the lining of the uterus so that implantation uh, becomes a problem. So that's one of the things that we also look at in folks with recurrent implantation failure. Do you have endometriosis? And we can test for that non-invasively now through a, a test that's known as Receptiva, which I think is a very, very good uh, test. So yes, she could donate her eggs. Um, uh, I would certainly want to check her blood tests to see. Um, and can you carry twins on purpose? We will, we will not counsel you towards um, having multiples because we do not want you to have multiples. Now, many people come into this because they do want to have multiples. <clears throat> um, we generally do not turn people away. We will not refuse to do a transfer of, of two embryos, for example, whereas many clinics will. Um, in fact, we are one of the few that will not in most cases, uh, but um, we will not counsel you on, gee, what are all the things that you can do to try to get there? Because we don't want you to have twins. It's a high risk situation. Uh, it, creates, uh, it creates some bad things that can happen to you, uh, to the pregnancy, to the baby. So that's not generally going to be our wish for you. Um, hi to Florida Babe 98. Um, Meg Britt says, does a saline sonogram hurt if you've had a tubal ligation? Tubes are absolutely blocked. That's already known. So I'm nervous about the pain. Can I wait to do a saline sonogram? <clears throat> okay, so the saline sonogram is definitely different from the HSG. The HSG or hysterosalpingogram is the dye test. And that's where we're placing material into the uterus so that it does flow through the fallopian tubes. Your tubes are blocked. So there's no reason for you to do an HSG. Um, that is the test that definitely hurts. Um, when I do a saline sonogram, most of the time people say they don't feel it, but other folks have told me that they have done uh, saline sonograms and they're, and it's very uncomfortable. It shouldn't be very uncomfortable, but it may be a little crampy. I tell people that the saline sono is more messy than it is painful, but the goal is to place a teaspoon of fluid inside the uterine cavity while doing a vaginal ultrasound so that we can see what the uterine cavity looks like. Not interested in the fallopian tubes, especially in your case there, uh, Meg, because you had a tubal. So, uh, but the, the saline sonogram is not for the tubes. It's for the uterine cavity to make sure that there's no scar tissue, no polyps, no bands of muscle, no balls of muscle, um, that the cavity itself is perfect and awaiting an implantation from a perfect little embryo. Um, uh, Leroy Emily B says, 40-year-old AMH of 2.2, but only got five eggs last egg retrieval. Anything to help get more? Well, so, you know, um, the first question is, I would wonder about what kind of protocol uh, you are on. Um, in many cases at CNY, uh, once you're over 40, you will get prescribed a mini dose protocol, mini dose. And the mini dose is, um, you know, uh, maybe certainly won't hyper stimulate you and you're likely to get good egg quality with fewer eggs. Uh, but uh, it may not be the age appropriate dose for you. So that too is something that you can ask for folks, uh, ask for a provider to take a look at. The other thing I feel really, really strongly about, and you've probably heard me talk about this before, so I'll throw in a plug right here. Um, I wrote a little book um, on the evidence-based protocols uh, for um for um, everything pertaining to fertility. And that's regular egg reserve, diminished ovarian reserve, um, embryo transfer, uh, sperm quality, folks who are trying at home, folks who are doing IUIs, folks who are doing IVF, um, based on the best available evidence uh, 
Uh, it's a nice little ebook. It's only seven bucks, and you can get it um, from the link that is on my Instagram, which is Randy Fink MD. And the uh, the actual uh, uh, link is called Linktree. It's l i n k t r dot e e slash Randy Fink, MD. Um, there's also a wonderful little uh, audio book uh, I did. Both those, only seven bucks. Uh, I think it's well worth it. If you get the uh, ebook with the supplements, it actually has the, uh, it's, uh, if you want to buy the supplements from a particular supplier, then you get a discount on there too that's uh, built in there for you. Um, so uh, please take a look at my link tree, L I N K T R dot E E slash. Randy Fink MD, or if you forget that, my Instagram is Randy Fink MD, and it's the uh, link that's uh, in my bio on the Instagram. Um, that will show you the entire list uh, of everything that you need in a very clear and concise manner, as well as a discount of how to get them on uh, on what to do for egg quality, how to maximize your pregnancy outcomes, no matter what you're doing. Um, no matter what kind of treatment you're doing. So please, I beg of you, take a look at that because uh, there is no question that these things do make a difference, 100%. Um, let's see. Uh, Barbara Brown says, what would you suggest for someone that stims too fast? You know, good question there. So again, we said that a, a stim for IVF, we want to be um, you know, nine to 12 days. So someone that stems inside of, let's say, six days is probably not going to have the egg quality uh, that you would if you if you stem for all nine days. So usually in that situation, we call it low and slow, Barbara. We slow down the stem, we drop the dose, which will stem you a little bit slower, uh, but give you much better egg quality. Hi to JM Dots. What should be explored if five FETs have failed with euploids made with donor eggs? Immune protocols used, all tests are normal and negative. So um, first thing I would want to know is when was the last time your uterine cavity was evaluated? So it would be a saline sonogram or a hysteroscopy. I would take a biopsy to know that you don't have chronic endometritis. I would ask about a laparoscopy or if you have been evaluated for endometriosis. And I think the easier way to do that is with the receptiva test. Um, hopefully, um, you have had those things done. However, if you've had all those things done, we really don't recommend the ERA so much anymore because it's kind of been debunked as a useful test. An ERA is called an endometrial receptivity assay, um, which looks to see the, the timing of when your endometrium is most receptive to an embryo. But the data shows us that uh, really it doesn't have a significant effect on pregnancy rates. And so it, it's a hard one for me to tell you is a, is a great idea, but um, it might be worthwhile if you've had, you know, five euploid transfers. However, you are the perfect candidate for the tacrolimus at 1.5 milligrams twice a day. The study was really built um, around patients like you because after, so one euploid embryo gives you a 65% probability of pregnancy. By the time you've done your second, you're at an 88% probability of pregnancy. By the time you've done your third, you're at a 95% probability of pregnancy. You are in a situation there where you've done five transfers. You should have been pregnant. So that tells me there is something else going on. I would evaluate all those things. But if they're negative, it would be Prograph 1.5 milligrams twice a day. Um, and that, uh, at least according to the data, with your euploid embryos would give you up to a 93% chance of pregnancy. So um, really, it was I, you are the person that that study was, was based on. Um, do you recommend Folostim, uh, low-dose HCG, Omnitrope, or Menopure with Folostim for 43 with a lower AMH? Been doing the first protocol with a with a lower fall stem, no luck after three cycles. 
Uh, I see. Are you saying uh, you recommend um, FSH with HCG versus Menopure? Well, if the lower dose, you know, if HCG hasn't worked for you, then I kind of feel like it's worth changing over to Menopure. Menopure often gives us a little better egg quality, might give us a little lower number of eggs, but a better quality of eggs. The problem is, is that it's much more expensive. So we typically start with the HCG LH, um, and I think that's reasonable, but if it hasn't worked for you, yeah, I would, um, I would move over, um, consider moving over to Menopure. There are some, also some other um, special protocols that are really designed for people who have been poor responders in the past, and especially those with, with low AMH. And so we might think about uh, looking at that for you. Uh, let's see. Um, what do we got here? Over on the Facebook side. Um, Oh, I just clicked a button and I blew through a whole bunch of them. So sorry about that. Let me see, see if I can get back up here. Lots of questions on Facebook. Thanks for being here. Uh, looks like Callie or Kaylee asked, getting ready for my egg retrieval next month. Uh, Brandis put me on immune protocol three without Omnitrope. It's a lot. Are there side effects if my body doesn't need all that? Excited and nervous to see you guys in Colorado. So, um, you know, Different people have different um, uh, perceptions here. Dr. Kiltz, who is the wonderful founder of CNY Fertility, uh, um, creates a very compelling argument that the immune system uh, is involved with every pregnancy-related transaction. And if, the, if you are at the point of needing IVF, then that immune protocol level three he believes is the minimum protocol you should be on. Now, there are other people who say, no, I think that's really too much. So most people don't really need all that. It's not entirely necessary. And it is absolutely your choice, right? So you can use them or not. You can ask for immune protocol two, if you would prefer. I For IVF, um, I really don't use anything less than immune protocol two. Uh, it's usually either two or three, and a lot of that, uh, Callie, Kaylee, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing, depends on your history um, and, uh, and what we think might, uh, might be the best choice for you. But it's all voluntary. It's all optional. Um, there's cake and, there, and there's icing. The cake is the stimulation. The cake is the estrogen and progesterone for transfer. The icing is the immune protocol. Can you eat cake without icing? Of course you can. Absolutely you can. Um, and so really um, it, it is uh, where you would feel most comfortable. Uh, but I know Brandis uh, um, likes uh, uh, immune protocol level three as a minimum protocol for people. And I think that's a, that's a reasonable choice as well. Um, Christine says, I'm moving forward with a laparoscopy and hysteroscopy after three failed transfers. Uh, four uh, total, one ended in a first trimester loss. If I have endo that is removed during the laparoscopy, how long would you wait until trying another retrieval or transfer? Uh, if you have, well, so um, a month or two, certainly no more. And I, I guess it really depends on if you have a lot of endometriosis uh, that has to be removed, then, then it may take a little bit longer for you to heal. But one to two months, I would say. And Christine, you are also an excellent candidate for um, for Prograph, 1.5 milligrams twice a day. You've had um, uh, three failed transfers and one first trimester loss. Um, that is absolutely appropriate uh, uh, for the history that that study uh, I talked about suggests. Um, Let's see. Uh, Jessica Huffman says, you did great for my egg retrieval last week. I got 47 eggs. Holy cow. And so far I have 10 frozen day five blasts. Jess, that is awesome. Boy, that is good news. Amazing. I'm so glad. And I hope you're feeling okay and that the bloating is better. Uh, hi to Gina. Uh, I have a transfer coming up later this month at my baseline uh, this Friday. This information definitely applies to me. I go to the Atlanta office and I've already asked for this dose of Prograph to be included in my protocol. So the question is, does that dose of Prograph 
make a difference in people who haven't had the um, haven't had the history that says, okay, yeah, it's going to make a difference. Do you know we can we test for that T T helper one and T helper two thing? You can. It costs thousands of dollars and it's probably not worth it for a medication that's safe to use in pregnancy and is going to cost you you know twenty bucks. So. Um, should we be using it preemptively in some people? And that may be uh, the situation there, Gina. So great. Enjoy your monitoring with the fine folks in Atlanta. Um, Aaron Haas is here. Do you recommend PGT testing? PGT is best used for folks who have a large number of embryos uh, in order to take that large group and separate out the ones that are going to have the highest probability of pregnancy. So let's say that you are, oh, 35 years old, and let's say that we get 10 embryos. Well, I know that at 35, probably about, no, oh, let's say 60% or so of your eggs are going to be normal, 60 to 70%, which means that three to four of them will not, let's say, God willing, you make five or let's say you, you make those 10 embryos, six of them are going to be normal, four of them aren't. Well, you might have to do four embryo transfers until you get to the first one that's normal. And that's a lot to have to do. It's an expense. It's a, it's an emotional expense. Heaven's knows to have to go through with that and keep getting, you know, negative pregnancy tests and wondering what's wrong when it may simply be an embryo factor. So the benefit of PGT is to take that same group of 10 embryos to test and see, okay, these are the six that are normal. So therefore, I know we're going to start with one of those normal embryos because the first normal uh, uh, euploid embryo is going to give you a 65% probability of pregnancy. Remember, the second one's going to give you an 88% probability. The third one's going to give you a 95% probability. So what are we doing there? We're saying let's narrow down the group. We're using nature and science to help narrow it down. That makes all the sense in the world. Now, if you have one embryo, let's say we're much more limited in the number, you make one embryo or two embryos, your body's going to give you the same information. You're going to put that embryo in and it's either going to stick because it's normal or it's not because it's not. So do you need to PGT test one or two embryos? I would say the answer to that is no, I, I wouldn't recommend it myself. Now, sometimes people will say, uh, well, all right, but I know I'm going to be doing, I'm getting one or two embryos per retrieval, but I'm planning to do three or four retrievals. Sure, then bank them up. Or, or I think the way the, the situation works with the uh, laboratory is that, uh, you know, it's up to eight embryos in a year or so at the same price. So you can kind of keep doing it. Um, and then in that situation, it, it may make sense. So that's my feeling about PGT. Um, Bethany asks, with thyroid disease, should I be doing an immune protocol? So that really depends on what you mean by that. So thyroid disease, if you're just hypothyroid, then we're, we want to treat that thyroid. We want that number, your TSH, to be between 1.5, I'm sorry, between 0 0.5 and 2.5. The way that works is that the higher the TSH, Remember my finger here if you forget this. The higher the TSH, the lower the thyroid function. So you increase your TSH, that means that the thyroid is more sluggish. The lower the TSH, the higher the function. So we want to keep the volume knob at a nice mid-range, which is between 0.5 and 2.5. So if your thyroid hormone is above a 2.5, we're going to give you medication because we want to bring it down. That improves egg quality and improves pregnancy rates overall. If you have autoimmune thyroiditis, which is called Hashimoto's, then um, I generally do treat the thyroid. Uh, and I also, uh, it, it, I, I like to keep that number a little lower if possible, keep it around a one. And I also feel pretty strongly that if you've got autoimmune thyroiditis, then, you then we know that you've got immune issues. And I think you should be on immune protocol three, my opinion. Uh, Ninzi asked, is a saline sonogram necessary to have before IVF or could we skip that? Well, so I 100% would never 
recommend that you put an embryo in, in you until that uterine cavity has been evaluated because a polyp or a bit of scar tissue or something on the inside can and will prevent that embryo from implanting. You are investing an awful lot to make these beautiful little embryos. So given that, you want to know that the place that they're going into is just as beautiful. Um, so you hear that again? The lawnmower is, oh no, it's a helicopter trying to land on my car in the parking lot. Okay, thanks for that. Um, um, so I, I would now, in, uh, in many of our locations, you can do a hysteroscopy at the time of your egg retrieval. And what I mean by that is that we can place a camera in and take a look around when you are under anesthesia so that you don't have to feel the saline sonogram and have to deal with that. They will not do that in Albany, uh, but we do that in uh, Colorado. They do it in Sarasota, I believe. They do it in Buffalo and they do it uh, in uh, Syracuse for sure. So, um, um, I do recommend you have the cavity evaluated. Yes. Uh, Elisa asks, what's the difference between a day, uh, the difference uh, of a day five and a day six embryo? Why is day five better than a day six? Well, the way a day five blastocyst performs relative to a day six is pretty similar. So I would say a day five, you know, basically you're saying, when did it become a blastocyst? And a blastocyst is the description that we use of uh, an embryo that has uh, become a little functioning machine. It's no longer just a cleaving bunch of cells trying to divide. It's a little functioning metabolic factory. Um, and there's criteria that they look at under the microscope to determine uh, what that means. So when did it become a blast? Was it day five or was it day six? Well, technically speaking, a day five is, is ever so slightly better um, because that's the average growth period for, uh, for an embryo to become a blast. Sometimes they take a little bit longer. And if it's day six, there's really not a significant difference. Where there is a, a little bit bigger of a difference is between a day five or six and a day seven. A day seven blast does not perform as well as uh, a day five or six, but any embryo can give you a baby. So if you've got day seven blasts, it doesn't mean anything is wrong with them. They became blasts, they survived, uh, and they will give you a baby just as easily as the other ones. So there you have it. Um, AZ Sunshine, I think you're my doctor. I certainly hope so. That would be great. Um, let's see. Can uh, Reiki Marcus says, can you take that if breastfeeding? I think if you're talking about uh, prograph, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I, my guess is I'd have to look it up. Um, um, if you're breastfeeding, however, we are not going to recommend that you proceed with fertility treatments because the outcomes when breastfeeding are, uh, are, uh, are certainly less uh, than uh, if you're not breastfeeding uh, during lactation. Uh, Sharmila is here. Hello. And asks eight months ago, my AMH was 0 0.77. Now it's 1.29. Is there any difference? You know, the AMH can vary and they say it can vary by, <clears throat> by about 30%. Um, that's a little more than, than 30%. So, you know, it only goes to show that it's, it's not a perfect test <clears throat> by any means. Um, you know, usually I would take the more conservative number if we were going to treat you. I would want to pick the lower number and say, well, okay, so we want to work that much harder to try to get you to respond. Um, so is there any difference in your situation? You know, it's it's really hard to say, but uh, that's kind of how I would approach it. Um, why Manny says, if implantation can happen up to five days after transfer, why is the beta done so early? Um well, because um, if it's if it is just getting uh, if it's just implanting, then um, you would expect to see some beta HCG in the blood. And of course, in the IVF world and in this fertility world, people are looking to get an answer as quickly as possible because, as you know, um, it is a, a very hard waiting game. So um, for sure, if you're doing home pregnancy tests and they're getting darker, I, I wouldn't stop meds. Um, but I would expect that if a pregnancy is going to be there, then we would expect to see some 
HCG by the first day that we're doing, you know, by day 10 or so um, after uh, uh, after pregnancy test. Now, you said day nine post five day transfer. Usually we look at day 10, but a difference of a day, you know, I would certainly want to take a look at that. Uh, Ariel is here and says, I have a day 6-2-BB frozen embryo. Is it possible to transfer that and a 4-AA together? You absolutely can. Uh, there is no rule. You know, so we typically follow the American Society of Reproductive Medicine guidelines on how many embryos you should be transferring as far as what our guidance is on how many you should have, but from an embryo uh, quality or an embryo uh, uh, grading standpoint, there is no rule that tells you what you can or should transfer. Yes, you may transfer those together. Um, can we, let's see, answer that one. Um, Shelby Lynn says, hopefully I'll see you early next week or this weekend. Stem seems the meds are working this go around. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, can you tell me your thoughts on, uh, this comes from Rachel, thoughts on changing protocols during stim meds if I have ovulated on my own while stimming? Um, well, I'm not sure kind of what you mean by that. Um, some people do break through the medications that we give you to try to prevent ovulation. And there are some other things that we can do in subsequent cycles to try to prevent that from happening. But as far as changing during STEM, well, if you're not getting a, a good response or if you're getting too robust a response, then oftentimes we will uh, increase or decrease the dose of your STEM meds, if that makes sense to you. Um, Let's see, uh, Danny McPherson. Hi, Danny. Uh, doing my first egg retrieval and hopefully fresh transfer in May in Buffalo. Um, no one mentioned boosters or an HCG wash. When would you recommend a patient add those on? Okay, so the um, uh, an HCG wash is done typically the day or, or two before embryo transfer. HCG boosters, my opinion, are best reserved for uh, natural or modified natural cycles. If you're doing a fresh transfer, that's going to be a medicated cycle. And I would not suggest that HCG boosters will make a difference for you. And so you can save yourself that, that daily shot. But an HCG wash, uh, I would definitely ask about when it's time to schedule your transfer for sure. Uh, I do feel pretty good about that. Um, thank you for doing lives. I learned so much. Thank you for watching lives. I appreciate that. We got a few more minutes here. Let's see if we can get some more answers in. Uh, looks like uh, we'll get this one from here and then we'll go over to uh, go over to Facebook. Uh, hi, I had a round of egg retrievals uh, and 11 of 12 eggs were GVs, which means that they were germinal vesicles. They were immature eggs. Uh, they suggested I could have PCOS should someone have seen irregular follicles or hormone tests under different sized eggs. Well, so what I, uh, Lindsay Chamber of Secrets, I like that name, that's good. Um, so what that suggests to me is that you probably had a bunch of smaller follicles, uh, uh, like a lot of smaller follicles, and uh, and your and your larger ones may have... Um, uh, they, they would have triggered based on the larger ones, and, and, and it may have been that you lost those if 11 out of 12 were, were immature. So that usually is a triggering issue or a maturity issue. I would stim a little bit longer or wait a little bit longer to trigger is what I would think there. Um, let's see. I'm, uh, this comes from Shelby. I'm on Provera this cycle. What does that do? And can I do a fresh transfer with that being added? The answer is no on the fresh transfer. So Provera is an oral medication that we use that's called an antagonist designed to prevent you from ovulating. So um, in most cycles or in many cycles, we'll use an injectable, which is which is uh, uh, Ganarelix or Cetratide. Um, Provera works a little better. Um, some people break through and they will ovulate through the, the antagonist. We don't want you to ovulate. We want you to grow those eggs, but we don't want you to release them until we're ready to come get them because we don't want them disappearing into your pelvis. We want them for our lab so that we can fertilize them, right? So uh, Provera is an oral way of doing that. I like it better because it's dirt cheap. It's probably three bucks for a bottle of 30 as opposed to, you know, $50 a shot or whatever the Ganarelix is. Um, 
it's one less shot to get, which is always a bonus. Um, and uh, it doesn't put a squeeze on the ovaries the way sometimes the injectables uh, can. The only downside to Provera is that you cannot do a fresh transfer. Um, um, you cannot do it. Yeah, you can't do a fresh transfer. You can't do a transfer when you've been taking uh, Provera because it's progesterone and it is affecting the uterine lining. Uh, Samantha says, just had my fifth transfer, first with the PGT tested embryo, and it wasn't successful. I was on protocol three. Would you change anything for our next transfer with our last PGT embryo? Well, so again, you know, uh, a PGT embryo, well, fifth transfer, first PGT, you know, I think you too would be a great candidate for, for Prograph, um, 1.5 milligrams twice a day or one milligram three times a day, uh, Samantha. Um, after five, uh, four other transfers and then one euploid, I would have expected a pregnancy uh, from you. So something is going on. Um, I certainly would want you to have that whole evaluation that we talked about before. Uh, I think it's definitely worth looking into. Uh, so please talk to somebody before you jump right into your next cycle. Okay. Oh my gosh, it's out of time again. How does the time go by so fast? You know, the problem was it was the eclipse. There's no question of it. It, it altered time. I think it changed the, uh, the, uh, the uh, embryo time uh, continuum. Um, gosh, it's so nice to be with you here every Tuesday, and and uh, and I hope you'll be with me next week. Please take a look at uh, at my uh, at the stuff that I've worked on through my uh, Instagram uh, uh, bio account. That link tree l i n k t r dot e e slash Randy Fink MD, or just look at my Instagram account Randy Fink MD. Click on that link in the bio. Uh, great little ebook about the supplements. Great little audio book. Working on a whole fertility course for you. Uh, I'm available for personal consults as well. This whole damn thing that we're all going through here, it's not your book. It ain't your novel. It is not the story of your life. It is only a chapter. And what are we doing here? We're rewriting it together. So every foot forward, every step you take, do it with kindness. There's not enough kindness in this world. Do it with love for other people. And most of all, do it with hope. Because tomorrow is a new day with all kinds of new possibilities. Thanks for being here tonight. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Till then, God bless. Good night.